Well, we are uh, nearing the end of our walk through 1 John. We're at the very end of 1 John chapter 5. We'll be looking at verses 13 through 17 today. The title of the message is Things We Know. John has just reminded the church of a very important truth. In verse number 12, he says, He who has the Son has life. He who does not have the Son of God does not have life. There's no middle ground there for John. It's pick a side. And so John writes that for those that have the Son, who have life, he moves directly into encouragement. He moves directly into letting those, those know who, who have the Son, letting them know. Here are some things that you can know. So let's look, beginning at verse number 13, and we'll make our way to verse number 17. These things I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life, and that you may continue to believe in the name of the Son of God. Now this is the confidence that we have in Him, that if we ask anything according to His will, He hears us. And if we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we have asked of him. If anyone sees his brother sinning a sin, which does not lead to death, he will ask, and he will give him life for those who commit sin not leading to death. There is sin leading to death. I do not say that he should pray about that. All unrighteousness is sin, and there is sin not leading to death. Let's pray together this morning. Almighty God, we come before you committed to you and your word. Father, we recognize that you are true and sufficient, and we recognize, Lord, that the Bible you have given us is true and sufficient. So, Father, we come to you seeking to hear from you, or seeking to hear from your word. Father, I pray this morning that you would speak to your church. Father, I pray this morning that, that you would use me to speak clearly. Most importantly, Father, I pray this morning, as John the Baptist did, that Jesus would increase, Lord, in this church, that I would decrease. Lord, help each one of us to see our utter dependence upon you. I ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So this morning, we're going to see two things that we know. We can know that we have eternal life, and we can know that God hears our prayers. So let's begin with the first one. We can know that we have eternal life. Verse number 13, these things I have written to you. It's a summary of the entire letter. Remember John's gospel the fourth book of the New Testament, John's gospel was written with the hope that those reading it would believe and that they would have life. The Bible says in John 20, verses 30 and 31, and truly Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. Now in 1 John, John is writing to those who have believed. He is writing to those who have life in Jesus' name. The emphasis of 1 John is to give assurance to those who have believed. It's written to emphasize that faith in Christ, obedience to Christ, love for Christ and one another, those are the birthmarks of a believer. Those are the things that give assurance to the one who has believed that they have been born of God. So back to verse number 13. These things I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God. Now we must understand that believe is not merely an intellectual acknowledgement of a statement of facts. 
The Bible says in James 2.19, You believe that there is one God, you do well. Even the demons believe and tremble. Remember the story of missionary John Patton, who was there in the South Sea, and he was trying to figure out, how can I explain to the native people here in their own language what it means to believe? what it means to have faith in Christ. A local man had come in exhausted from working that day, and he collapsed there in a chair. And he said to John, he said, Listen, it is so good to be able to rest my entire weight in this chair. And John Patton knew right then, there's my word. That's what it means to believe. It means to rest all of one's weight to give all of your trust to Christ. So we see here to believe in the name of the Son of God is to believe in the person who is the Son of God. The Bible says in John chapter 1, verse 12, but as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God to those who believe in his name. So John has written a letter here that we call 1 John. He has written this letter to individuals who have believed in the name of the Son of God. These are individuals who have placed their faith in Christ. They have placed their faith in Christ and they have the forgiveness of sin and they have eternal life. John goes on to say why this letter was written. Look to your Bible, verse 13 that you may know that you have eternal life, and that you may continue to believe in the name of the Son of God. The objective here is not hoping that you have eternal life. The objective here is knowing that you have eternal life. Knowing is permanent. Knowing here is absolute. It's based on the authoritative and trustworthy testimony of God. Have. It means it is in your possession. It's not the present that's under the Christmas tree that you're waiting for to be yours. It's not the present that's under the Christmas tree that doesn't have a name on it that you're hoping is yours. It's not the spot that there used to be a present under the Christmas tree that's now gone. No, the Bible says that you can know that you have. It means you have it. It's not something that you can misplace. It's not something that can be discarded. A believer may know that you have eternal life. Knowing that you have eternal life, John goes on to write, he wants the church to continue to believe in the name of the Son of God. It means continue on the path. Don't waver in this belief. Continue walking with Jesus. Confident. Jesus is exactly who the Bible says he is. Confident that Jesus has done exactly what the Bible says he has done. Now the church here in Ephesus that John was writing to, the church today... We face and they face false teachers. The false teachers in Ephesus were coming after that very confidence. They were trying to shake the believer's faith. They were sheep, or excuse me, they were wolves dressed in sheep's clothing. And they were causing tremendous harm to this church. They were deceiving the believers into thinking there was more for them to know. They were denying what the believers knew to be true. They were presenting themselves as teachers that had access to additional knowledge that those believers could not have. They were false teachers who were presenting themselves as having access to deeper truth that those believers just couldn't get to. And in response to these vicious attacks on the church, John reminds them, you can know you have eternal life. 
as these false teachers are causing doubt, as these false teachers are coming after you, John wants the church to know, you can know you have eternal life. Assurance. That, uh, that idea, that, uh, that belief. Knowing that you have eternal life. Assurance is a struggle for so many people. I struggled with assurance for years. Folks come to me seeking me to, for, for me to help them, to help them with their assurance of salvation. One thing that they have found out, I won't give it to them. If they come to me wanting assurance of their salvation, I'm not going to give it to them. We open up God's Word. We go to God. He's the one who must give that assurance. You see, when it comes to assurance and when our assurance wavers, don't anchor yourself to your feelings. Don't anchor yourself to the opinion of others. Anchor yourself to a solid rock. Anchor yourself to a sure foundation. Anchor yourself to the God who cannot lie. Stand firmly on his promises. Jesus said in John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. If you can lose that life, if that life can end, it wasn't everlasting. Our God has promised everlasting life. The Bible says in Romans 8, 38 and 39, For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. For many Christians, I believe the issue of assurance comes down to who has who. Jesus said in John 6, 39 and 40, This is the will of the Father who sent me, that of all he has given me I should lose nothing, but should raise it up at the last day. And this is the will of him who sent me, that everyone who sees the Son and believes in him may have everlasting life, and I will raise him up at the last day. Jesus will not lose those that he has. So let me ask you the question this morning. Have you believed in the name of the Son of God? Are there identifying marks of a believer present in your life? Is your life marked by belief, obedience, and love? If you have not believed in the Son of God, if your life is not marked by those things, sit down this afternoon and read John's gospel account. Remember the very purpose that he wrote it. And truly, Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. If you don't believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, let's sit down. Bibles open. This is a matter of eternal significance in your life. If you have believed in the name of the Son of God, if you have placed your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, and you struggle with assurance, sit down and read 1 John. Remember the purpose in writing. These things I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life, and that you may continue to believe in the name of the Son of God. As you read 1 John, be assured as you see the identifying marks of a believer in your life. Belief, obedience, and love. Stand on the promise of God who says, He who has the Son has life. 
and as assuring as that truth is, gain confidence and know what it means for the Son and the Father to have you in a two-handed grip. Jesus said in John 10, 27 through 30, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me, and I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish. Neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. My Father, who has given them to me, is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand. I and my Father are one. If you have believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, you have been forgiven of your sin, you have eternal life, and the Father and the Son have you in a two-handed grip. You can't work your way out of it, and no one could snatch you from it. The Almighty God has you. And understand, eternal life is not merely duration. Non-believers will have eternal torment. Eternal life is to know the Father, and it's to know Jesus, who said in John 17, 3, and this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. Knowing that you know the Son, knowing that you have eternal life, it leads to the assurance that we can know God hears our prayers. Look to the Bible in verse 14. Now this is the confidence that we have in Him, knowing that you have eternal life, leads to confidence in prayer. It leads to a boldness to come before your heavenly Father and make petitions. And we must rightly understand where our confidence is placed. It's not placed in ourselves, but in God. Look at what the Bible says. Now this is the confidence that we have in Him, that if we seek anything according to His will. John had previously written in chapter 3, verse 22, and whatever we ask, we receive from him because we keep his commandments and do those things that are pleasing in his sight. So he laid one guardrail for us that God hears us when we believe in the Son and love one another. Now in verse 14, we see that God hears us because we are asking in accordance to his will. You will never have more certainty when you pray than when you pray the scriptures. Your certainty will rest when you pray God's word. According to Romans 12, 2, God's will is good, acceptable, and perfect. And when it comes to prayer, we have to understand that prayer is not conforming God's will to our will. Prayer is conforming our will to God's will. I think too often we mistake prayer and we think we're in a game of tug of war and our objective is to pull that rope and to pull God and His will over to what we want accomplished. When you think of prayer, visualize that rope, but understand it as you're ascending a mountain, hand over hand, you are trying to reach the goal, which is conformity to God's will. Jesus taught us to pray in accordance with the will of God, saying in Matthew 6, in this manner, therefore pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Jesus demonstrated what it means to pray in accordance with the will of the Father. The Bible says in Luke 22, And he was withdrawn from them about a stone's throw. And he knelt down and prayed, saying, Father, if it is your will, 
take this cup away from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. You may ask, well, why would Jesus pray this way? Knowing what lay before him, Jesus was praying in accordance to God's will. Remember, God's will is good and acceptable and perfect. Look to the Bible again, verse 14. Now this is the confidence that we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. Think for just a moment about the beauty of those words. He hears us. The Bible says in Proverbs 15, 29, the Lord is far from the wicked, but he hears the prayer of the righteous. The believer is clothed in the righteousness of Christ. The believer, by the Spirit of God, is surrendering himself or herself to live righteously. The Bible says he hears us. To hear means to listen to. It means to pay attention to what is being said. When you think about prayer, prayer is coming before Him. Prayer is coming before Him with confidence. Prayer is coming before Him with confidence and asking. Prayer is coming before Him with confidence and asking according to His will. Prayer is coming before Him with confidence and asking according to His will, knowing that He hears us. Look to the Bible, verse 15. And if we know that He hears us, think about the significance of that statement. The Creator of heaven and earth, the creator of all that there is listens closely to you. The senior adult, lonely and suffering due to the separation that COVID-19 has brought into their life, they come before God and they pray, Dear Lord, Please don't leave me or forsake me. They're confident. They know that God has heard them. God has promised, I will never leave you nor forsake you. That lonely and suffering senior adult knows God has heard my prayer. Think about the man, whether young or old, shackled to pornography, He comes to God in repentance and prays. The very words of David in Psalm 51 become his words. As he prays, have mercy upon me, O God, according to your loving kindness, according to the multitude of your tender mercies. Blot out my transgressions, wash me thoroughly from my iniquity, and cleanse me from my sin. God hears the prayer of that man. Think about the woman, whether young or old, feeling as though she does not measure up. Maybe she's a middle school girl that's been wounded by her friends or a woman who has been wounded by an unfaithful husband. She comes to God. In brokenness, praying the words of Psalm 139, 14. I will praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are your works, and that my soul knows very well. God hears the prayer of that woman. They begin to see their value and worth in the eyes of Almighty God. One commentator writes, when it comes to prayer, knowing that God hears us is enough. Knowing that we have the ear of the creator of the universe, we can cry out to him 
that is enough. Look to verse 15. And if we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we have asked of him. Now here we are, bound by the restriction of verse 14, asking in accordance with God's will. Remember the Apostle Paul. He pleaded with the Lord three times to remove what he called a thorn in his flesh. He called it a messenger of Satan that was tormenting him. Three times Paul prayed that God would remove that. Paul desperately wanted it removed. God did not remove it. Instead, the Bible says in 2 Corinthians 12, and he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, most gladly, I will rather boast in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in needs, in persecutions, in distresses, for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. One commentator made the point that prayer is the means God uses to give his people what he wants. Verse 15 gives us the principle that we can have confidence in prayer. Verse 16 is the application of this principle. Look to your Bible, verse 16. If anyone sees his brother sinning a sin which does not lead to death, he will ask and he will give him life for those who commit sin not leading to death. There is sin leading to death, and I do not say that he should pray about that. A challenging, challenging verse there before us. A commentator said there are as many interpretations to this verse as there are words in it. We must under understand this verse correctly. We must allow Scripture to interpret Scripture. Now remember what I said on Wednesday night when you approach a difficult text and you come to a passage in Scripture that Christians can and do interpret differently so long as they are within the confines of Orthodox Christianity. Some of these passages there's going to be disagreement over. So we'll approach the text with humility. Let's define the terms, life and death. The first question that probably pops in your mind is, are these spiritual or physical? Now, in 12 other uses in 1 John for the word life, and in two other uses in 1 John for the word death, John uses the words there as spiritual. Every other time in 1 John, life and death are spiritual. Now, there is biblical precedent for God taking the life of a believer prematurely, in our sense, for sin. We see it in Acts 5 with Ananias and Sapphira. We see it in 1 Corinthians 11 with the Corinthians church's approach to the Lord's Supper. However, I believe it makes the most contextual sense here in 1 John to look at these terms as spiritual. John has just written, He who has the Son has life. He who does not have the Son of God does not have life. So I make the interpretation that this is spiritual that we're looking at. Now we carry this forward. What is this sin leading to death? Now remember, this church was in the middle of a battle against false teachers. And John was writing with instruction. Turn back with me in your Bible to 1 John 2, verse number 18. Because this is the clearest, I guess I'll use the word attack, 
that John takes against the false teachers in letting the church know what is going on. So if you look back to 1 John 2, 18 through 23, the Bible says, Little children, it is the last hour. And as you have heard that the Antichrist is coming, even now many Antichrists have come, by which we know that it is the last hour. They went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would have continued with us. But they went out that they might be made manifest that none of them were of us. But you have an anointing from the Holy One, and you know all things. I have not written to you because you do not know the truth, but because you know it, and that no lie is of the truth. Who is a liar but he who denies that Jesus is the Christ? He is Antichrist who denies the Father and the Son. Whoever denies the Son does not have the Father either. He who acknowledges the Son has the Father also. So John is writing to the church, and he is saying there used to be folks right there in the midst of, of the congregation. You would have referred to one another as brother, but now they are no longer a part of the body. They have denied the Father and the Son. Remember the specific accusation that John is pushing back against. These false teachers denied that Jesus was the Christ, that he had come in the flesh. They denied the very incarnation of the Son of God. So my best understanding of this challenging, challenging text is the sin leading to death is denial of Jesus. Denial of who he is, that he came in the flesh, and what his life and death has accomplished. A genuine Christian cannot commit the sin leading to death. With that understood, let's look at verse number 16. If anyone sees his brother sinning a sin which does not lead to death. Notice the words there, sees it. This isn't second-hand account. This isn't overhearing gossip. This is if you see a fellow believer sinning a sin which does not lead to death, he will ask. Notice there, that's not a command. It's not something we're being commanded to do. We're being shown here in the Scriptures, this is the natural response of a Christian. If you look back in 1 John, the Bible says in chapter 3, verse 17, but whoever has this world's goods and sees his brother in need and shuts up his heart from him, how does the love of God abide in him? The argument there is, if we see a fellow believer who lacks food, we must not withhold material assistance. We must not withhold food. Now we see a similar argument. If we see a fellow believer who is in sin, we must not withhold spiritual assistance. We must not withhold prayer. Think about Abraham in Genesis 19. The Lord has just revealed to Abraham the sin of Sodom and the destruction that is about to be brought upon Sodom. As Abraham hears these words... He doesn't pat himself on the back and say, man, that was such a smart decision for me to stay away from Sodom. He doesn't run to Sarah and say, guess what? Sodom is about to get what they've got coming to him. I told you this was happening. I'm so glad we stayed over here. Abraham doesn't turn away and just ignore the fact that Sodom is about to have fire rain down upon it. If you go back to Genesis 19, you will see that Abraham petitioned 
the Lord. Abraham prayed. Church, prayer must be our default. Whether we are confronting sin in our own life or in the sins of the life or in the life of another believer, prayer must be the default. Praying for repentance, praying for restoration. Look to the Bible, verse 16. There is sin leading to death. I do not say that we should pray about that. Another tricky component here of verse 16. It's not a command that we're not to pray for that type of sin. However, as one commentator puts it, perhaps if a believer continually is praying for that type of sin, that it may pull them away from God. It may lead them to begin to doubt God. Whatever it might be, we're told here, I do not say that he should pray about that. It's not a command to not do it. John is just giving us counsel. You look through verse 16, tremendous attention. There has been much written trying to determine on what this sin is that leads to death. What happens when we focus all of our intention on trying to navigate a tricky part of this very difficult verse? Prayer is neglected. Go back to the principle. We have an obligation as believers to pray for our brother and sister who are sinning a sin which does not lead to death. As we spend time after time after time trying to navigate and understand every commentator's perspective on what this sin is that's leading to death, we begin to see that a life committed to holiness and forsaking sin in our own lives starts to be neglected. The church can begin to accept sin. The church can begin to, to make way to justify sin. The church can even find themselves embracing sin. And to that, John writes in verse 17, all unrighteousness is sin. In chapter 3, verse 4, John wrote, whoever commits sin also commits lawlessness. And sin is lawlessness. Lawlessness is rebellion against God. Unrighteousness is a violation of God's standard. Those two things are profoundly serious. Rebellion against God, violating His standards, they bring consequence. For the believer, we understand that sin is forgivable. But we also must never regard sin as inconsequential. The Bible goes on to say, there is sin not leading to death. Now it's good and helpful to navigate these challenging verses, trying to understand what is being said. But don't miss the point. We must confidently pray for those whose sin is not leading to death. We're to confidently pray for those believers who are dabbling their feet in sin. They've touched their toes into the water. And they've realized, well, there's nothing wrong with that. Before too long, they're up to their knees and their ankles in sin. The church is still turning a blind eye. And then we see them swimming in sin. We see them posted all over Facebook. We see it as a key component now of their life. And we never took the time to pray. We never took the time to go and warn them. James writes in James 1, 14 and 15, but each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires and enticed. Then, when desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is full grown, 
brings forth death. Church, let us love one another enough to pray for one another, especially in the areas regarding sin. When we see sin in the life of our church, let us pray early. Let us pray often. Let us be reminded of the command in Galatians 6.1. Brethren, if a man is overtaken in any trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness, considering yourself, lest you also be tempted. Church, we have an obligation. If we love one another, we're to pray for one another. We're to make means to restore one another as we see each other drift toward sin. The Bible says in 1 John 5, 12, He who has the Son has life. He who does not have the Son of God does not have life. Those who are here this morning who have the Son, you have life. You can know that you have eternal life, and you can know that God hears your prayers. As we come to a close this morning, I want to just remind you, 1 John was written to Christians. So as John tells the church and warns us and says, listen, as you see someone within the family of faith drifting towards sin, pray for them. They can be restored. John's gospel was written for the unbeliever. It's an ever-present reminder that sin has brought separation between you and God. That sin leads to death. The Bible says, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. So if you're here this morning and you've never believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, my appeal to you today it would be to recognize God as creator. Recognize you have sinned against Almighty God and repent. It means return from your sin today and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. You will be saved. If you're here this morning as a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, hold closely to these things that we know. If you waver in assurance, know it's right here. These things are written that you may know that you have eternal life and know that you can have confidence when you pray. Let's pray together. Almighty God, we thank you for your word. God, we thank you that uh, it is the very word of God, the very word of a God who cannot lie. Lord, your word is sufficient. Father, I pray for each one here this morning that they will take the truth of your word and they will apply it to their lives. Father, I pray if there's anyone here that has not been given life, Lord, has not been born of God, I pray today would be the day they would turn from their sin and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Father, if there's anyone here this morning that struggles with assurance, Lord, I pray today, I pray the words they heard from your word this morning would be an anchor that they can attach to. Lord, give us confidence as we pray. Give us courage to pray, Lord, for those drifting toward sin. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.